Jerome mentioned that a summary has been written and one of the things that we need to do is to work on this. So it's quite, he mentioned 24 pages, which is amazing, but I'm just going to go through very quickly some of the points in the summary so that you know what was in there. So the next slide, please. Well, no, here we go. So, there we go. So this, oh, anyway. So one, one before. One before. How do you go back? Uh, the red button. The green button? No, the red button. Okay, okay. Overall, okay. Cool. So this is, this is the, over, so you can read these, which are the summary points for the overarching call. I mean, we all agree that there needs to be uh, a reduction in, in carbon dioxide. We need to address the cryosphere and all of the things that's happening to the cryosphere. We need to look at the social dimension of the changes that are happening. And we need to think, certainly to accelerate the political process so that the cryosphere doesn't melt any further and disappear. And we need to in involve, I think we do need to bring together a lot more people to work on this rather than working in our own areas particularly and in make sure that we're improving our own footprint while we're doing this research. So this is the summary we made of the speakers who are going to talk about their research in a moment on this. And you can see in bold the main areas that we uh, talked about. So I'm not going to read it all, but it's sea level projections, ice-ocean interactions. I don't think we can think about ice without actually thinking about how it interacts with the oceans, certainly in the polar regions. Past climates, which means ice cores, and what it tells us about how the cryosphere developed in the past, or how it, how it waxed and waned during the past. The water resources, which are really important for the mountain glaciers particularly. The hazards, which we've just seen also come from the mountain glaciers. Ecosystems in every part, and what happens as the cryosphere melts, and the ground left. This one? This one? Yeah. And uh, we also need, it's a big, big problem in really remote areas. I don't think probably there's any field work that's more, more uh, tricky and, and, and in remote than some of the work both in the high mountains in the polar regions. And we also need to take action for all of these, for the people and for the good of the planet. So what we're going to do in this session, we have two major topics and two sessions. In this session, we're going to cover the polar regions and the cryosphere of the polar regions. And this afternoon, we have another session where we're going to deal with the mountain regions, the high altitude regions, which brings in a more of a, a human interest in terms of what we saw in the, in the Himalayas, but also in the Andes as well. So what we'll do is we'll hear, hear the four speakers who are going to give a summary of the area and answer those questions. What are the gaps? How are we going to fill them? And how do we tell, talk about this to politicians? And then the floor will be open for questions. And we'll finish at quarter past one, hopefully. So Andy, over to you. So the next speaker is? Um, I'm Andy Shepherd. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, could we have the next slides, please? Um, the, the clicker. Yeah, change the presentation. The clicker, for anybody that's presenting, does not work at all. The people in the room are watching you on video and you make an action that looks like you're pressing the clicker and they'll move the slides. So that's just a top tip if you're giving a presentation. So I'm Andy Shepherd, and I'm going to talk about uh, monitoring Earth's ice from space. Just a few slides. Oh, you thought I'd pick the clicker up there, I can tell. Uh, could we advance? And, yeah. Oh. And again? <laughs> my word, my word. Yeah? Okay. This is Cryosat. This is Europe's ICE mission. It was launched by the European Space Agency in 2010, and it's been monitoring every corner of the planet since then. And it actually now gives us estimates of ice change everywhere, from the North and South Poles and to the mountain regions as well, and in the sea as well as on the land. And we've been able to total up the total ice loss across the planet. This is just some of the examples from Cryosat. Um, it's been in space for now 13 years. We're going to make a maneuver change in, in November, later this month, that may extend the mission by another two or three years if we're lucky. 
And, um, uh, and it's our only ice mission. It's the only thing that we've got monitoring the planet right now from, from uh, a European perspective. And it's really, really critical because it's been able to monitor the changes uh, that are contributing to sea level rise and other, other impacts of ocean freshening and uh, albedo effects around the planet. Uh, I just want to run through some of the examples um, of, of ice change that we've monitored. Next slide, please. Ice change that we've monitored from... from this is really difficult. Okay, so um, Earth's cryosphere includes seven different elements. It's the polar ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland. It's the ice shelves that surround Antarctica. It's the sea ice in the northern and southern uh, oceans, uh, the Arctic and the southern ocean, and it's the, uh, the mountain regions around the planet. We've heard lots and lots about those different parts of the cryosphere and how they're changing from people, updates from the last IPCC assessment report. Uh, this is just a quick whistle stop tour through all the different estimates that we've been able to uh, monitor from space. So the biggest losers are the polar um, ice shelves around Antarctica. They're losing about 300 to 350 billion tons, gigatons of ice per year and have been over the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, the next biggest loser is, is Arctic sea ice, about 330 billion tons of ice per year. Um, and, and that's been progressive. Lots and lots of uh, different estimates of, of that have been produced over the years. Uh, after that, it's mountain glaciers, 260 or so billion tons of ice per year from 200,000 mountain glaciers around the planet. And then after that, it's uh, the Greenland ice sheet. Um, it's melting more rapidly than Antarctica right now, and that's because it's further away from the pole. It's in a warmer climate. Uh, and then the Antarctic ice sheet is losing about 100 billion tons of ice per year. And even during the satellite era, uh, the sea ice in the Southern Ocean has been uh, reducing in, in volume and mass by about 40 billion tons of ice per year. So that's all corners of the planet. It's not a good news story at all, unless you think about the knowledge that we've been able to create about the cryosphere from space. So I heard lots of support for field observations. They're really, really important. But satellite measurements are a cornerstone of climate science. We wouldn't know much about climate change if we didn't have the satellites in space. They really, really are critical alongside the numerical models to predict the changes into the future. If um, we add that all up, it's about a trillion tons of ice per year being lost around the planet. So that's an ice cube about 10 kilometers high. That's, uh, this is an animation that European Space Agency created of these data um, for Paris. It was produced last year. Yeah, sure. And um, it, we're, we're losing a, billion to, a trillion tons of ice per year. Half of that is from the land, and that causes sea levels to rise from glaciers and the polar ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. And the other half is from the oceans, so that's the ice shelves around Antarctica and the sea ice in the Arctic and the Southern Oceans. They have different impacts upon the planet. Uh, the ice that's melting on land causes sea levels to rise around the planet. And the ice that's melting in the oceans already belongs to the oceans, but that causes changes in the albedo of the planet, if it's sea ice in particular and changes in ocean currents uh, if it's the ice shelves. And in particular, changes in the extent of protection of the land ice in Antarctica from the surrounding oceans. If we lose ice shelves, then we lose the barrier that currently exists between the ocean, which can deliver a lot of heat to the, to the land ice. And we, we see very lots of evidence of, of dramatic changes when that happens. So if we add up the sea level contributions due to the polar ice sheets, just Antarctica and Greenland, over the past 20 or 30 years, we can see that the rate of ice loss is increasing over time. So in the early 1990s, Antarctica and Greenland were not losing a great deal of ice. Uh, but by the end of the 2020s, they've contributed about two centimeters to sea level rise. Now, that might not seem a lot, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but the most important thing from this chart, at least, is to see that the pace of sea level rise is much, much faster today than it was 30 years ago. So it's six times faster from Antarctica and Greenland than it was 30 years ago. So how does that compare to the AR6 projections? Well, here are the AR6 projections. And you can see that the ice losses that we're observing are tracking the upper range of the IPCC projections, the ISMIP-6 ensemble. Not the mid-range, the upper range. So there's a problem there, because the upper range, first of all, means an extra 17 centimeters of sea level rise by the end of the century. But also, we don't really know the upper range because we're tracking that upper range. So something has to be fixed in terms of the sea level projections, at least if we, if we believe the, the, the match between the satellite observations over the past 30 years and those models. And why does that matter? Well, this is New York City, which flooded 
in 2012 because of Hurricane Sandy. I'm sure you've all heard about this. And if you look at the tide gauge on the Hudson River, you'll see uh, very, very clearly when the flood occurred. It occurred on the 22nd of October in 2012. And that was when sea levels were much higher than would normally be the case. You can see the tidal cycle here. Uh, and it was a confluence of the storminess, the low pressure, uh, the increased rainfall that was coming into the rivers, and the prolonged effect of the storm over the city for three days through three tidal cycles, uh, which caused 50 square kilometers of the land to flood, 46 people to die, and 20,000 homes to be flooded. And this is a once in a 500 or 1,000 year event, unless you raise sea levels by 80 centimeters. And if you raise sea levels by 80 centimeters, it will happen in New York every year, maybe two times per year. So every centimeter of sea level rise matters, and, and people are planning for the changes that are gonna happen. You might not think 80 centimeters matters, but it matters to a very, very large number of people around the planet. And you can see that if you look at the, 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 the populations that live within around a metre or so of sea level rise. And this is, this is data that was collected a couple of years ago. But you can see that right now 250 million people live within one metre of the high tide stand. Uh, and they get, they get flooded uh, at once per year. And you can't afford to be flooded once per year if you live in a, in, in a 20 million population city, for example. Every centimetre of sea level rise causes two to three million more people to be flooded each year. So that's why every centimetre of sea level rise matters. And the two centimetres that we've had over the past 20 years have caused an extra four to six million people to be flooded once per year around the planet. Um, and we can plan for that if it's going to happen in, in 10 or 15 years, but we can't plan for that if it happens every year. So we, we have to take note of the changes that are happening in the cryosphere today. And things are happening much more rapidly than we thought. We've already seen some examples of this. So, so even since AR6, we've seen rapid losses of ice from mountain glaciers, um, 10 meters or so in the past couple of years. Michael said something about that earlier. We've seen rapid loss of sea ice in the Southern Ocean. That's happened since AR6. We've seen collapse of, Jane doesn't like the word collapse. We've seen loss of sea ice at record rates over the past couple of years in Antarctica. And it's still unknown as to why that's happened. We've seen a curious stasis in ice loss or the volume change of Antarctica. And that's because it snowed more in the past couple of years in Antarctica than it, than it normally does. And so if you look at the record alone, you'll see that Antarctica appears to not be losing ice, but strip away the changes in snowfall and the, the glaciers are dynamically out of balance still. And we've seen actually um, sea ice collapse, disintegrate in front of the Larsen ice shelf, um, which has caused the glaciers uh, to, to now accelerate once again. So four really strong signals of imbalance just in the past two years alone. So my conclusions are that Earth is losing a trillion tons of ice per year. Try and remember that number. Um, we're on course for about 80 centimetres of sea level rise by the end of the century, and, and uh, uh, you'll hear some more about that next. It's coming. Uh, every centimetre floods two to three million people extra per year. You should remember that number because people think a centimetre doesn't matter at all, but it does. Changes are so rapid, we, we need annual assessments. And there are lots of annual climate assessments around the planet, and they're not authorised by the IPCC. They're not authorised by a single body. And people pick and choose the ones that they, they, they want to, to use, whether that's for political or national or, or, or for other reasons. We need a single climate assessment, and we have the tools to do that. Um, we can do it in other areas of climate science. We can definitely do it in cryosphere science. Um, ice ocean interactions, we've heard that, are the key unknown for the future. We need to improve our ability to predict changes in sea level from the polar ice sheets. And there are lots of people in the room who know much more about this than I do, but I'm absolutely certain that this is the big tractable science problem in climate science. And the reason we haven't solved it isn't because the people, the good people that are working on it are, are not good enough. It's just because there isn't an international body responsible for making sea level predictions into the future. It's done by national agencies and we need a coordinated effort for sea level projections to improve the certainty, because right now, the spread of sea level rise estimates, you'll still read in the literature, is between one to two metres by the end of next century. And, and that is unacceptable for policymakers. Satellite data is key to our understanding of the cryosphere, and has been. We're going to have a gap between 2025 and 2030 between cryosat, which will run out of fuel, and Europe's next polar mission, 
crystal, which won't be launched until 2030. So we're going to lose five years of measurements of the polar ice sheets. And we do need to do something urgently about that. And that's going to require coordinated international effort as well, because the only realistic solution is aircraft. And that's going to take a lot of hard work. But there's time to solve that problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next, <laughs> next speaker <laughs> is Hans Ang Lee. Do you want to introduce yourself? <clears throat> and you can okay, thanks. Thanks, Jane. Oh, so long. Okay. Um, my name is Hans Ang Lee from Korea Polar Research Institute, and um, it's really grateful to have an opportunity to share that and then share what we found in Antarctica and then let's travel to Antarctica. And um, it's kind of like a, a bit of um, striking features we observed in the Antarctica on site. So, um, yep. Uh, right. Okay. As you know that the um, Antarctica should be white and then ice, ice cold forever, but it's not, as Andy showed earlier. Um, the Antarctic is not. Yeah, the Antarctic is not immune to climate change. A striking example occurred on the Antarctic Peninsula back in 2020. Um, as you can see here, this is the Antarctic Peninsula and then our Antarctic wintering station on King Sejong, King George Island is surrounded up top there. And then um, as you can see here, we have um, the beautiful King Sejong station as, um, as you looked at here, the 2013 covered by ice and snow. And um, it happened 2020, all ice gone. So as you can see here, no, there is no white there. So during the heat wave, the, the landscape was completely transformed here. And also another striking feature is that the rapid warming on the, the peninsula affects not only the, um, the ice, but also the ecosystem around. For instance, um, the widespread presence of Antarctic hair grass, the here you can see here, um, suggests that the temperatures are nearing about like a 15 degrees Celsius, um, which is really significant rise happening around here. Um, I never get bored of watching this striking feature. Um, we captured around the uh, nearby Jangbo station around Nadawa Korean overwinter station in Turnover Bay. It occurred um, back in 2014, January. Uh, you might um, hear, it's kind of like at the above zero temperature, it leads to melt pond formation on ice surfaces. Uh, these melt ponds quickly refreezes because uh, Antarctic air temperature um, really usually below zero. So we need to have the temperature remains the beyond zero for about a, a week that time. So our temperature stayed above zero for over a week, resulting, as you can see here, in a large scale sprog glacial river and the export of substantial fresh water into the ocean. This is the reality in Antarctica today and we anticipate such events will occur more frequently in a warming world in the future. Another one is that decade of satellite moon sensing, as Andy previously uh, mentioned and illustrated, have shed light on the, the accelerating ice mass loss. Currently, uh, the Antarctic ice um, is losing six times more ice mass annually than it did 40 years ago, particularly in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Why is the Thwaites Glacier significant? It moves at about two kilometers per year, one of the fastest um, glacier in the Antarctica. Uh, its position um, of a, a marine base makes it um, topographically vulnerable to warm water intrusion, and its, it's reverse slope um, allows for rapid retreats. And um, despite extensive observations, in advanced modeling, in that predicting and um, the Antarctic ice sheet's evolution and future sea level rise, this critical region inside the, underneath the ice shelf 
um, remains unexplored due to logistical and technological challenges. We use two approaches for direct measurement in the cavity region. One is the hot water drilling for hydro, hydro, hydrographic moorings and the submersibles um, deployment beneath this um, ice shelf. I will now uh, share our efforts to collect in situ data for the Thwaites Glacier. Um, without nearby stations, we rely on icebreakers like the, um, this is Korean ice breaking research vessel, our own, equipped with two helicopters uh, that uh, 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 enable us to access high risk re the areas like heavily crevassed regions. Um, here is our hot water drilling operations in collaboration with the um, British Antarctic Survey. We drilled a um, borehole, deployed the instruments um, to measure ocean properties under the ice, and also collected sediment samples, installed the marine for long-term monitoring until the batteries um, deplete. Um, this movie is showing that the downhole view through the borehole. Now another um, approach to explore underneath the ice shelf, we also deploy autonomous and water vehicles beneath that region, providing valuable data sets over a broad area. Additionally, um, we can collaborate with the partners here. So to monitor ocean properties during the even austral winter season, crucial to, for understanding the southern oceans, the dark season. And another technique um, involves dropping CTD sensors from a helicopter into small holes near the grounding zone. This successfully um, executed two years ago. And um, our operations um, revealed the rapid melting near the Thwaites Glacier grounding zone main trunk, likely due to melt driven, melt water driven buoyant upwelling. This process brings warm, warmer water and dense from the ocean's lower layers to the ocean um, ice, ice shelf base, uh, causing more active melt in the basal melting than previous thoughts, as indicated by um, lower, lower, lower right uh, to panels, and as indicated by the, these red colors, significant, signifying, um, signifying higher water temperatures than um, those in Pine Island Bay, the warm water um, normally found. The, um, yeah, this is the uh, most difficult challenge for me. So, to, okay, right, okay. Back. Yep, my message is very clear. So um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really, um, I'm not here to alarm you, um, but um, I wanted to share what I personally have. Um, I witnessed what's really happening in the Antarctica. So um, the timing is not just now, as you know that it's already overdue, so we know what to do. So the thing is that, the most important thing is that we must act now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wan Sang Lee, thank you one of the biggest glaciers and really worrying what's happening in the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Over to you, Frank. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm waiting for the slides to appear. So my name is Frank Patton. I'm from the uh, uh, Free University in Brussels. Uh, and I'm an ice sheet modeler. It sounds a bit like an apology after everything we saw by now. It is a bit like an apology, as you will see when these slides are arriving. So, um, I was asked to show five slides, and I will show five slides, and Flo will do that as well. <laughs> it's just the previous speakers, they have another concept of five slides. <laughs> Well, yeah, ice sheet modeling. Uh, so it's, as I said, it is a bit of an apology because 
in a, in a way, uh, as you have seen, we are still dealing with very large uncertainties. It's uh, one pl planet, uh, what is it? Uh, pa patin. One planet patin. Patin? Yeah. was appropriate. <laughs> it's gonna come. So, no, so uh, we are de still dealing with uh, uh, large uncertainties um, and that is especially coming from the modeling. The, the uncertainties are not that large coming from observations. So, and given what is at stake, I mean, in terms of uh, as, as Andy has shown uh, in terms of potential flooding, oh, you see, uh, it, it is quite important that we focus on that. So, um, uh, the, the next slide, please. Uh, uh, you can, okay, good. Okay, so here you see a simulation, and that is a simulation of Thwaites and Pine Island Glacier. Uh, that illustrates what, uh, yeah, the danger is if we reach a tipping point and we run into an instability. And in principle, this thing should move towards an instability, it doesn't. Okay, these slides are way too stable. <laughs> um, so, and this is part of the largest uncertainty. And the reason why specifically we have this uncertainty is that it's very difficult to gauge how much, how fast, in other words, to say the precise timing when this goes away. And if you take all models together, all simulations over the next 100, next 200, next 300 years, all these models, they run into an instability of the West Antarctic ice sheet under certain scenarios, uh, but at different times and that leads to a large uncertainty. So it's specifically trying to find out, I'm, I'm going to try to make it. Okay, well, I can do next slide and then trying to go. Yeah, there we see it, it's moving, it's moving. Okay, and so here we see that this whole drainage basin disappears. Right, so what, what are we missing uh, in, in our understanding? Well, we have seen it, ice-ocean interaction is something that we are missing, uh, especially the circulation that is occurring underneath uh, subshelf cavities. And the reason why it's so difficult is a resolution issue, because these shelves, they might look very big in all these pictures that we have seen, but for an ocean model, these are really tiny features. And so you need a very high resolution ocean model to resolve this as well as a high resolution ice sheet model to do so. Um, and we are also another problem that is in our missing is that we are a small community of people that are dealing with modeling. And just to give you an example, I put here a, a paper up that I published exactly 20 years ago. It was a new model. Um, and that is just, as you see, it's a one author paper. Uh, now, you would think that we would by now understand pretty well what ice sheet, how ice sheets behave and how you can um, yeah, understand the physics of ice sheets. But then you see that 20 years later, exactly, you have another paper coming out by Jeremy and Sam. <laughs> questioning uh, whether the physics that we understand, whether they are valid. And so this is still the level of debate where we are in our community, which is, yeah, I think lagging quite well behind a climate community. Now, so brittle processes is something that may become much more important. And so, in fact, yeah, we, we, it's not only those brittle processes, it's not only the processes that is represented by an ice sheet model, but the uncertainty stems from the whole range, from drivers to the impact. And with the drivers, we have atmospheric forcing, we have ocean forcing, we have ocean circulation, changes in ocean circulation and the way this is represented in ocean models and climate models. And they will impact 
how these ice shells react through melting from the top, from the bottom, as we have seen that these processes are actually occurring. Occurring, But then there is also these brittle processes, our ice breaks, uh, we see a lot of damage uh, uh, currently on ice shelves, but this is also something that needs to find its way into the physical description of, of models. And then only, only then you have a reaction of your grounded ice sheet that loses mass and transfers it faster into the ocean leading to sea level rise. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, you, you, it's, it's a long process. Now, as I said, we are a small community and in a way all these projections that are done like in the framework of ISMIP 6, that was for the last IPCC uh, assessment report 6 that, that were done, well, these, these projections is, is more, it's often considered as being a hobby project. Uh, because we don't have real dedicated funding for this. There are projects in which we improve, that we make projections, but IPCC has a certain agenda, has certain deadlines, and it's very, very difficult as an international community to focus or to follow those deadlines. So that is uh, why it's important that we, we try to, to increase the, 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 um, the amount of people that we have in, 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 uh, in this community uh, and to move it from a hobby project to a larger recognized platform. Uh, another factor that is important uh, and may become important in future projections or to improve projections is, is the, the freshwater fluxes. I mean, that is coming from the ice sheets through melt, through iceberg calving. These freshwater fluxes, they come into the ocean, influence the ocean, influence the ocean circulation. And this is still not yet captured in the projections that we are doing. So as key messages, well, I think the most important message is, of course, uh, what we did find with these ice sheet modeling and with the ISMIP 6 is that if we keep to the Paris Agreement, we, uh, well, we don't, we, 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 we will uh, avoid major ice loss and major ice loss acceleration. Beyond that, it becomes more uncertain and let's say it ascertains more uh, that we have a higher probability that uh, you get some um, major ice losses over shorter periods. As this figure shows here, and this is from a recent EU uh, protect, uh, project, um, it, uh, this link uh, links to a uh, policy brief that is, uh, was given in Brussels. So we need a strong community effort of modeling as well as observations for uh, capturing future ice sheet mass change and their impacts on sea level rise. And we need to address our knowledge gaps on deep uncertainties, meaning how fast ice can waste. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And over to Florence, who I know will follow Frank smoothly. So, because you've been planning. Yeah, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I tell a story. Well, um, yeah, I can tell once upon a time, because that's exactly what I will be talking about. Um, so, we, we have been uh, uh, talking about observations, so the state of the crisis today. How will we use those observations to um, model those uh, ice sheet instabilities and ice sheet evolution in the future and also to understand what's going on also right now because it's not only about the future. Actually, uh, I mean, um, I wanted to effectively talk about um, how uh, we, we know that the future uh, is not effectively science fiction, as I said this morning <laughs> in the, during the introduction, because that's important. Because if you, if you, if you know, I mean, we, we don't know exactly what will be our trajectory emission pathways in the future, so we, we can imagine an infinity of future. And the state of the models now, both climate and ice sheets, can allow us to uh, invent and imagine an infinity of future. 
But how do you know that what we are projecting or presenting as uh, some kind of uncertainty ranges or uh, numbers for adaptation planning to policymakers or practitioners are something that we are just not, you know, uh, t telling you and uh, no, no strong support or whatever. I think that the panel of climate evidence are very important to include in this framework because this is what um, also pushes the ancient model to make some efforts in the physics because it gives some basis for them to do that otherwise we can invent whatever physics to trigger whatever instability and I think that's important we 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 do not imagine that's how it is so we we all know the impact I just thought well, why does this matter because it's important to just you know see the effect of uh, major storm surge and urban floods or coastal erosion and actually unfortunately for those that were there in September in Trieste I mean uh, a few days ago we had a major 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 storm uh, storm surge in Trieste that completely destroyed all the coastline but really destroyed it so we get of course a lot of flooding but well 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 um, behind the, the seaside actually uh, because of intense precipitation and at the same times during the high tides and the low pressure system and whatever exactly what happened in New York actually and so it really destroyed massively the infrastructure um, flooded everything so now we we are thinking about reconstructing but so to us it happens five times a year now uh, over the past five years and uh, so but this one has been the strongest one uh, ever uh, because we never saw pieces of roads exported away uh, whatever and uh, I was with some colleagues on the seaside during the the different stage of the storm surges and it was really um, impressive to see the, the just the strength of the sea uh, destroying everything so it matters and uh, we are not prepared to really face this kind of damages anyway so most, most of the knowledge gaps I think my colleagues really summarize them very well and uh, I think the big uncertainties are really also uh, related to the interface with the processes right atmosphere and ocean and this is where we are lacking most of the observation because of course the interface somehow or the, the ice, ice atmosphere interface is more accessible than the ice ocean interface however for Antarctica it's still a challenge to observe surface mass balance correctly and how it is nowadays and how it has been evolving in the past decades that's for us a big a big problem though we have some observations because we are in an area of exploration of Antarctica however it's only very punctual fragmented so we, we do not have a big picture of how Antarctica evolves at the surface it's very complicated so it's even more complicated to observe it from below the sea surface okay and it, within the cavities because it's even more challenging and there is another interface we seldom mention but it's the ice bedrock interface because all those processes are linked together I mean when you accumulate some ice at the surface of the earth you deform it if you melt the ice the, the surface rebounds back to its um, previous position but this kind of interface and interactions they they interact together they can slow down those ice uh, instabilities or they can unfice them uh, just enhancing the instability and the sea level rise that uh, subsequently happens so what we have been talking about so far is that we we are still there it's challenging to retrieve the observations uh, that allow us to understand the physics of those processes not only of the ocean only the atmosphere only or the ice only which still have some gaps but also the interaction between them because right now the ice is melting because it's warming above and, and below actually so that we we need to understand that and probably we are not aware of some of the processes occurring as well so it's not about we have an idea of the everything happening no pr probably we are missing some processes uh, also on the road and so the, the paleoclimate records here are very important because though of course they are very indirect uh, testimony of what happened in the past actually it happened because you can see them in the data but you see the end of the chain so you can see when the ice shelf collapsed completely disintegrated melted away and so you only have ocean type of sediments instead of having I don't know uh, pieces of rocks brought um, brought in by the by the, uh, the glacier advance on the continental shelf so you can see the evolution of the different um, environments uh, below the ice actually and the transition between when an ice shelf was there and was starting to collapse and the grounding line retreats so you can't see these kind of things right now in the sediments but the physics that lead that led to those, obs those observations those proxies 
it's still hard to constrain anyway. So the paleoclimate anyway can help you to constrain that the velocities of the retreat, that we, we can do that. And in many of the area we have been observing them that are here uh, cycled on the Antarctic map, we know that it takes a few centuries that the time scale of the marine ice sheet instability. So everything that projections are showing uh, beyond the 21st century, but toward 23 or 25 centuries, is okay, that's the right time scale. We should monitor these ice yeah, sheet instabilities. And if we want to um, be able to see the early trigger of those instabilities, um, uh, we still need to then come back to uh, our decades of projections, of course. And well, we have been focusing a lot of West on, on West Antarctica because of course nowadays this is the area where uh, the, most of the thinning is, is uh, going on. But East Antarctica, now we have proxies and, and evidence that for most of the past interglacials actually, uh, those sectors, they also retreated. So East Antarctica is not as stable as we think. Um, so that needs some efforts. Now when we take some few paleoclimatic simulations of ice sheet dynamics, those two models, they have a different physics inside. So I mean, uh, I, I, I wanted to show the, the extent of uh, what we have in terms of physics of instabilities, but they all lead to, of the, to the retreat of those sectors that are vulnerable today. So the sectors that were vulnerable yesterday and in the past are the sectors that will be vulnerable in the future. So that's, that's important. Uh, and both the models and the paleo evidence uh, support, support that. So now, um, if we look at our projections, uh, beyond the 21st century, because this is where most of the long-term processes are at play, we can see that according to the scenarios, if we meet or not the Paris Agreement, uh, we, we have more than one meter sea level rise anyway, and it's just go getting worse with a worst case scenario, of course. But if we put aside then some paleo range of reconstructed sea level change in the past interglacials or during Pliocene that was a, a warm period, like uh, somehow perhaps the closest that we are of our states right now, we are five meters and more of sea level rise. So all those numbers that we are projecting with our physics now, even though it's not complete, it's imperfect or whatever, it's realistic anyway. So at least it gives a basis that what we are doing is not, uh, let's say, science fiction. So what needs to be done or some key messages? Well, so the theoretical physics is something that we really, we really need right now. Most of the project, of course, ask us also to make some impact studies, but at some point we will not be able to make a progress in the impact studies as well, because we don't have the physics to improve them anyway. So we need really to focus on the physics. Uh, the long-term cop of their system simulations are really needed because we are talking about ice sheet projections on the long term, but we also need the climate projection on the long term because climate is driving the ice sheet response, actually. And then we, we definitely need, uh, I emphasize what uh, Andrew was saying at the beginning, we need global observational networks in the, continu in the continuity. I mean, if we have interruptions, uh, how can we definitely check back our model projections or our model physics improvements, whatever. So we need an effort to really realize, make the, 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 the people that found our research to realize that we need continuity. I mean, a gap of five years is unacceptable in a context of uh, adaptation to sea level rise. I mean, it's, it's impossible that that's occurring somehow. And there is a real importance uh, because Antarctica is a challenging place to, to really reach, to develop more cooperation in sharing research infrastructures because they are very costly. Uh, they are hard to manage also logistically. Going to Antarctica is very challenging as well. And if we want to have an idea and ob obtain a broad picture of all the processes together, a multidisciplinary framework of the, those processes in interaction, we need to cooperate more uh, between the different states. So it's, it's a bit beyond the research framework. It's really going to the logistic and the, the Antarctic Treaty at that point for Antarctica and probably Arctic Treaty for Greenland and uh, some places in the Arctic. And uh, well, I mean, most of the impact that we will observe, of course, in Antarctica, they have some very strong uh, global uh, impact as well. So, I mean, there is nothing disconnected in the system. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Florence, and all of our speakers. And it's really quite amazing how there are some consistent messages coming out about what, where the gaps are and what we need, all, all different scales. So now we have a little time for discussion before I leave you for lunch. Um, we also have people online who may be asking questions. Anna, are there some questions from online? No. But so does anybody have a question in the audience that they'd like to ask generally or ask of any of the speakers? Just wave your hand. There's what this one there? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, it's not only a question, it's mainly a comment. Uh, you did not talk a lot about the, the interaction between atmosphere and glacier. And uh, we have seen uh, during the last, uh, last year in Antarctica, for instance, that the, the precipitation were huge due to extreme events and uh, the, the mass balance was positive there. But we also know that extreme events can lead to very extreme temperature. For instance, last year we had a 40 degree anomaly in, at Vostok and uh, in 2020 we had a, a temperature of 18 degrees above zero. Uh, in Esperanza station and extremes are related to the atmosphere. So uh, this is my comment. Uh, in the main points that we have seen in the first slides, uh, there were the, the link between ocean and, uh, and uh, ice shelves and, uh, and, and glaciers, but uh, there is also to study uh, the, the impact of the atmosphere with the glacier, and uh, in particular we know that they are linking the low latitudes with the, the high latitudes, due to, for instance, something that I like to study at the moment, uh, which are atmospheric rivers, but uh, they, are, uh, they, they could be a, a good way to, to, to make a link between climate change and uh, uh, climate impacts in Antarctica because they are transporting heat from regions where the global warming is already present to one region where the global warming is not very, very clear. So this is the first point. And the second point is that uh, this relationship is even more important on mountain glaciers because they don't have any link with the ocean. So uh, uh, well, I would like to have your opinion on, uh, on this. Is it really crucial to study uh, the link between atmosphere and glaciers? Yeah, I totally agree, Vincent. Um, and, and I think it's more important because now we have looked, we focused ex uh, especially on the Antarctic ice sheet. But uh, I mean, it's definitely atmosphere for this in, in current state. This is very important for the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and of course, you, you see, I mean, the, 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 the mass budget that enters into the ocean is a difference of two large numbers of what falls on it and what, what you lose. But I think what is maybe important in this ice-ocean effect is that it may trigger an instability. Uh, it's, it's, it's not your surface mass balance that will trigger an instability as such but it will definitely help or even slow down the fact that you obtain an instability. And it's also one of the reasons that in, in the simulations that were done for AR6, that you see prior to one, 2100, you see a general scenario independent result. Um, so for a, a, a low scenario, you have like less precipitation increase, but also less risk of, of, of losing, uh, of getting an instability of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And in a high-end scenario, you get more precipitation that then offsets potential uh, instabilities. So it's, that, that is also one of the reasons why it's crucial to, to understand also the, the upper boundary condition. Yeah, I mean, uh, Frank showed a nice graph that uh, had the mass balance for Antarctica and Greenland. And if you, if you looked at that carefully, the last two years for Antarctica, it's stasis. There's no, no net loss of mass, and that is because of extra snowfall. So from my perspective, for monitoring dynamical imbalance, we definitely need improved predictions regionally of the snowfall and the melting in, in the polar regions. We, we need that absolutely, or we can't tell people the change in the dynamic instability. Frank's right that, that 
m most surface mass balance processes don't lead to instabilities in the polar ice sheets in the same way that ocean interactions do. That's not to say they're not important, it's just that they're reasonably well modelled in Greenland in particular and in the northern Antarctic peninsula where we see some melting. But it is also true that the jury is still out on ice shelf collapse and it could have been surface mass balance processes that drove that. So, so it's absolutely important that we continue to, to, to look at those two. Uh, thank you. Um, again, not a question. If I understood well, we, we are also here to try to improve the text, which is not that easy when we have a glimpse on it. Uh, but what I could have read is, I think I was not able to read the word model. Uh, we, and then I will strongly push what Frank said. Uh, we are talking about adaptation uh, and uh, without proper projection, we will not be uh, able to adapt in a proper way. Uh, and for projection, we need models. So I definitely think that models should be much more push in the text than what I was able to read. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, it is mentioned collaboration, cooperation, synergy with observation. But we definitely need this for the modeling community. We all have to realize here that we rely on the global sea level by 20 people, something like that, around the planet, doing that on their OB time during the weekend. I think it's completely crazy. And basically, that's it. Yeah, we, we don't have enough time, I don't think, in this first session to, to have a detailed discussion of the priority points. But there were eight. I've got them on my phone here. Sea level projections is the first priority from, in the message. And that, that's all about models. Ice ocean interactions is the second priority. And then past climates and what we can learn from the past is the third. Then we have three that are related to glaciers, water resources, hazards, and ecosystems. And then the seventh and eighth are collaboration and action. So I, I, my suggestion is, is that we might want to have a discussion on each one of those bullet points with them up on the screen and, and people can, can contribute towards the text and, and, and add the word model if it's missing. From but, but maybe it's been a long morning, right? I mean, maybe we can... We've got 90 minutes in the afternoon session after the glaciers, so maybe we should let everyone have a, a, a chat over lunch and, and continue the discussion then, I don't know. There's another session coming in, but everything was late, so we'll carry on being late, shall we? Um, I think there's another question. Yeah, um, I, and I think some of you, all of you on the panel will know that, that I'll say this. When you're talking about uncertainty to policymakers, I think it's actually very important to make largely clear that the uncertainties are all going in one direction um, in most cases. So that's, that's always an important point because uncertainty otherwise is seen as an excuse not to take action on mitigation or adaptation for that matter. So it's always something important to keep in mind. I wanted to take up also um, Alan's suggestion. I, I think, you know, with the state of the cryosphere reports that ICCI puts out annually, we try to do these updates. But I think if there were some sort of mechanism to take up your suggestion, maybe even as a deliverable from this conference that the, the community somehow get together to do that on an annual basis. That would be fantastic because then you've got academic institutions that are doing this, whether it's observations or summaries of projections, important work that has come out, that might be a really important thing to do. That was one thing that came to my mind that all of you have said we need more specifics in certain areas, but there seems to be a real need for everybody in the different areas where they're working to get together. Ocean, ice, atmosphere, the physics, the modelers, everybody really needs to get together a lot more than, than we do at the moment. That would be a very, very big conference, but it would be the way forward, I think, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I think what I was addressing there was specifically maybe even just Antarctica or Antarctica and Greenland. That, that might be a bit more doable at the start. Yeah. Uh, Valerie, did you want to comment? Uh, yes, I had uh, one comment uh, related to your suggestion to provide annual updates. So for the state of global climate, we tried to do this. It's Foster et al. ESSD, June 2023, using more or less the same methods and sources of data as in the AR6, and then looking at what's observed, what can be attributed with similar methods, and there are things we could not do. Um, so for the state of the cryosphere, there's always a delay. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, 
out of phase in a way. And then the other point is attribution methods. And the last point is what, what can we do as a community to pro provide clarity on what is committed and why we establish something is committed. Mm -hmm. So in the AR6, this builds on one paper, basically, Bauer et al., looking at committed sea level from past emissions. But I think there's really need to advance the framework in which we bring the multiple pieces together so that we can update that. And for that, there's a need to agree on the framework, uh, which is uh, so far missing. And I think it's really important because I think this uh, aspect associated with irreversibility and the margin for, for action mm -hmm. is politically very important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the advantage of an annual science assessment is that, that you can decouple it from the, the more pressing thought related problems about how to solve improving predictions and things like that. At the moment, it, a lot of that is lost in the IPCC reports because it's reporting the state of the climate and, and alongside it, and it, it needs to be there, it needs to be produced. But then, of course, the urgency of the changes that we've seen that, that happened so rapidly, everyone's given different examples over the past couple of years, they're lost in the cycle, the six-year cycle of IPCC. So, so moving to a, a more rapid annual assessment is going to be a win-win for everybody, It'll allow attention to be focused on the remaining unknowns. Thanks very much. There's, I think, one more, and then I think we have to allow the next sessions to go ahead. Well, uh, like this morning, uh, Pam just asked us, Pam also asked me about the annual assessment. I think uh, we, uh, that's depending on the different uh, uh, parameters. Uh, let's see, for the glacial, we have mass balance. Each year, we release the data for the, from, the, uh, from these typical uh, uh, mountain glaciers. But for the area, it doesn't matter for each year, each year. So that, that's what I'm saying. For the purple frost, of course, we also release the data for the uh, soil temperature and uh, uh, active uh, layer thickness. That's the only problem. So which means assessment means, yes, IPCC has a five or six years or even seven years. It's a little bit late, but each five years at least we need the glacial area. That's very important. But uh, the mass balance we already released uh, for the benchmark glaciers. So that's my, <laughs> that's my uh, thought. Thank you. Are there any further comments from the panel? Well, I think we could carry on discussing this for days and days, but we've just made a small inroad to it. Thank you to all the speakers. And we will, we will um, come back this afternoon at 2.45 into this room and we'll deal with the other aspect, which is the high altitude mountain glaciers and the really key issue of, of hazards and water supply. So I'll see you all again then. And thank you very much to the speakers.